evening. You're both here. Excellent. All right, so if we have any visitors, uh, you probably stand out tonight. So my name is Charles Plemons. This is a study on Proverbs, and if you are following along live streaming with us, we welcome you. Is there anyone here who needs either a full workbook for the class or a handout for Section 4? Okay. All right, so I've changed the opening screen here a little bit. The uh, interactive bit that we were trying wasn't working all that well. And then here, ironically, tonight, we've got a lot of people who may be streaming at home. So sometimes you just can't win, but we'll give it a shot anyway. So I put up here, though, a reminder of this app called Verse Locker. I've mentioned that several times. It's, it's a, an a, application you can download on your phone. It's available on multiple different phone device OSs, and it's a great way to memorize scripture. And if you're struggling with that, which I tend to do, this has been very, very helpful for me. Several people have come up to me and said, hey, this is working great for me. So if you haven't checked it out, Go ahead and take a look at it. It's free to use and seems to be pretty effective. So we are talking about Proverbs, and we are talking about a section right now called, or that we've titled Abomination to the Lord. And we covered several different topics in this section. This is the third week we've been talking about it, and I'll just remind us of the things out of Proverbs 6 that he listed as things that are an abomination to the Lord. So there were seven things. It's a proud look, a lying tongue, a hand that sheds innocent blood, a heart that devises wicked plans, feet that are swift in running to evil, a false witness who speaks lies, and one who sows discord among brethren. So we've worked our way through most of that list and we're going to get to the end of it tonight. And then there's a few others that are listed elsewhere in Proverbs that we're going to add in that weren't in this initial list. So last week we were talking about this idea of shedding innocent blood, the idea of people being hurt in various ways through our actions or lack of action, the various things that happen to people. Uh, often we're talking about the idea of uh, murder, but there are other things where people get involved in a crime and somebody gets hurt or killed that also falls into this. We also started talking about this idea of wicked planning. So wicked planning being that you are contemplating doing something wrong and you are making the effort to carry this out. So this is ruminated in your heart and you've decided that you are indeed going to do it and you're going about the steps to make it happen. So of course that is an abomination to the Lord because he doesn't like whatever it is that you're about to do, let alone the buildup, all the things you go about to make this occur. We talked about this idea of feet that are swift to evil or swift to mischief. So those that are eagerly running after the wrong things. It doesn't take much provocation for them to seek evil. They don't think through their actions. They are just eager to go either with the flow or choosing to do the wrong thing. Then we're ready now to talk about false witness. False witness. So we already, if you recall, talked about lying. This falls into that as well, but it's called out as a separate item here in Proverbs 6, as we read. So what does it mean to be a false witness? Untrue testimony. Untrue yeah, so that's, that's a lie. It's a very specific type of lie. And this lie is going to interfere with or prevent justice. So... The rule of law and order, it can't really result in true justice if the witnesses are not giving the true account. Justice, from a worldly standpoint, really relies on honesty from witnesses. How many things happen in the world that 
need justice where the only proof are the witnesses. If we say you can't take witness testimony because people could lie, then how many bad things would go completely unpunished because we have to throw out witness testimony? We have to have that as a cornerstone of our worldly justice because there's so much that only witnesses can prove. But throwing these lying witnesses into the mix, that perverts our opportunity for justice. Now, we mentioned a while back, is either last week or the week before, fortunately, when it comes to eternal justice, this isn't something we have to worry about. We don't have to worry about someone taking the stand before God and bearing false witness against us and God believing them over reality. God knows all, God sees all. That's not a concern from a spiritual standpoint for us. But right now, we're dealing with worldly justice, and Proverbs is teaching us a lot about how to live in this world. It's giving us godly spiritual principles to live in a physical world. And so our law and order here, because we don't know all, we can't see all, we have to at times rely on the testimony of witnesses. It's critical for our justice. So what are some of the effects of a false witness? What can that lead to? Yeah, the wrong person gets punished or convicted for something. Absolutely. So is that justice? Certainly not. Certainly not. So a false witness can lead to the wrong person or people being punished. What else? Yeah, so the opposite, right? So you could have the person who did do something then not meet justice. Now, justice is important. You know, punishment for crimes done is important. But there's a deeper issue in society that goes along with that. So it's, let's say, for example, you have someone who is doing wrong and you have false witnesses that keep that person from being punished for it, they could be more likely to continue to do wrong or do something even worse, and it have even further effect in society. So the justice for the one deed is important, but there could be even longer-running ramifications when we have this justice prevented or justice perverted. Sometimes it can lead to death. If you'll recall, we read about Jezebel, and that was from, I believe it was 1 Kings. Yeah, 1 Kings 21. Let me just reread that for us. We read this last week. 1 Kings 21, 15 through 16. It says, And it came to pass when Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give to you for money. For Naboth is not dead, but alive. So it was when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab got up, went down to take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So in this situation, we had someone framed, and it led to their death. So a false witness can truly, literally be a matter of life and death, depending on the situation. So, we read that story, Jezebel's the one that set up this situation, and it led to Naboth, Naboth's death. Who was guilty of shedding his blood? Jezebel? Okay, I'll take that, that's true. Is there anybody else? Ahab, the false witnesses. Say. Like, They're in the worst situation. 
Yeah, so Jezebel is guilty, certainly, because she set this up. But the false witnesses, they're the ones that allowed this to even happen. So they are guilty also. So when we were talking about that shedding of innocent blood, you see how all these things can tie together and we can understand why God hates these things so much. So often sin has this ripple effect. You know, just it continues to spread and more and more and more things happen. And it catches up other people in these waves of guilt, if you will. So in this situation, we had these false witnesses that were guilty of the blood of Naboth. So they are just as guilty as was Jezebel. Any other consequences of false witnesses or anything else you can think of involving those before we move on? All right. Well, the next one that was listed then was sowing discord. Sowing discord. So discord is a a word I think most of us are familiar with. It's not all that common. What does discord mean? Stirring the pot. pot. Okay, that's a good one. Any others? Strife. Strife. Yeah, stirring the pot. Strife. Yeah, it's, you've got harmony and then disharmony. You know, so discord is this strife, this struggle, this calamity, if you will, that is going on among people. This putting people against each other, causing unrest, if you will. There's all kinds of different ways we can define discord. So God wants his people to be united. United people, God finds this is good and pleasant. Let's look in Psalms 133, verse 1. Psalms 133, verse 1. It says, Behold how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. God wants people to live harmoniously. Now, that doesn't mean God expects that we are always going to agree. God knows that there's going to be disagreements. God knows that there's going to be conflict. But we should have this mindset of unity. We should have a united goal. We should have a united mindset on how we're going to address these conflicts and issues. And overall, we should be united in our love toward God and love toward one another. So when we have this unity, life is good. Life is pleasant. If you stop and think over the last week, over the last month, things that have caused you grief or stress, how much of that is based on conflict or disharmony with other people? with what other people are doing, whether you know them or not. It could just be things that people are doing in society. It could be specific situations with family or friends or coworkers. How much strife do we go through? It's all around us. And we know that that is less than pleasant. That's not good. God doesn't want us to live that way. God wants us as his people to live in unity. Now, let's think about some of the things that can destroy that unity. A big one is the G word. Gossip. What is gossip? OK, 
okay? Spreading things that we aren't certain are factual, okay? That's a good one. How else? Okay, so sure, sometimes there, it may be a fact, but the best way to address it is one-on-one. -on -one. Sometimes there's not even anything to address. Sometimes it's just a fact that gets spread around that may not even need to be spread around. Just because you know something doesn't mean you need to tell something. And just because you know something doesn't mean that it's something bad, but spreading things around, some people will take things different ways, you can get people involved in things that they have no business being involved in. So it can be things that we aren't sure of the truth. It could be the absolute truth, but it doesn't really have a purpose to be talked about or spread around other than to give us something to do, I guess. And how often do we end up in that situation? You're, you're having small talk, having conversation. Oh, did you hear about so-and-so? Oh, what about this? And a lot of times we don't even mean anything about it. But we end up spreading these things and sometimes we don't know if they're true. Sometimes they're blatantly untrue. And so all of this conversation happens. And sometimes it can be hurtful. Sometimes it can be harmful. Let's look in Proverbs 26. We're looking at verses 20 through 21. Proverbs 26 20 and 21. It says, Where there is no wood, the fire goes out. Where there is no tailbearer, strife ceases. As charcoal is to burning coals and wood to fire, so is a contentious man to kindle strife. Somebody said stirring things up. Fits right here, doesn't it? Fits right here. This idea of continuing to keep things going. So the lesson here is if there's no fuel for the fire, the fire will go out. So if there's a topic that comes up and it gets people stirred up, well, you know how things are. You forget, don't you? You get, you move on to the next thing in your life and you kind of put behind whatever. But if you've got someone who just continues bringing up whatever it is and keeping that in the forefront, ha have you ever gotten over something and then somebody bring it up to you again and then you're all fired up again? Why do we do that? Why do we allow that to happen? But we do it. And we see that that's not new. It's obviously not new. We see it right here. This is ancient history being told to us. It's not new. When we stir the fire, when we add fuel to the fire, then the flame continues. So it says, where there is no tail bearer, strife ceases. Now this is not the answer to ending all strife as human beings. But again, think about how many things do we get upset about because of what other people do? And how many times do we then run tell, can you believe what this person did? What's that do? It gets that person worked up. They may not have even been involved. And sometimes I think we rationalize it. You know, it's like, well, I'll feel better if I go tell this person. Maybe, maybe they, can, they can talk me down. But how many people also run in, they're just trying to get people worked up. You know those people, right? You know, they, they just go from door to door to door down the office or, or whatever, you know, trying to, hey, did you hear what the boss is doing? Did you hear, you know, whatever. Where there's no tail bearer, strife ceases. So it describes the man who tries to kindle strife, that person who is trying to stir things up, as being contentious. Now, we do have two levels of this, right? We've got the person who is very intentionally trying to do this, but we also have the side effect also. And I think that's what a lot of things that we end up doing falls into is we're not really thinking about what are the long-term ramifications? What is the impact of me saying this to whatever, sharing this information that I know? 
I don't think we're always trying to cause issues, but sometimes, don't you realize, oops, I've said too much. I shouldn't have told them that, or why did I bring that up? That's contention as well. That's still gossip. And that's something that God wants us to guard against. We need to think through what we're telling people and why. And what is the effect of those things. How many times have we seen gossip destroy friendships? You probably know of examples. Either it may have happened to you. You probably know people that this has happened to. Let's turn to Proverbs 16, 28. So back a few pages. Proverbs 16, 28. It says, A perverse man sows strife. Now, a minute ago, we called that the contentious man, right? So here we've got another term. The perverse man sows strife, and a whisperer separates the best of friends. How can that happen? How can somebody just whispering things drive a wedge between people? Yeah, you don't have to tell everybody all the baggage. And so best friends often share things with each other that they might not share with someone who is not a good a friend, perhaps. So the baggage, if you will. You have a close friend, a close confidant. You confide in them. For instance, I know a lot of things about Dale that I really don't know. Well, just you saying that you should have seen the look of relief on Dale's face when you said, I'll never tell. So. I kid. Friends can be driven apart by the conversations other people have. Sometimes, do you, do you ever have a friend that does something that maybe you don't like or has a habit that you don't like? And maybe you don't want to say this to your friend, but you might say it to another friend, and you don't really mean anything by it. It's like I said earlier, you're not trying to stir up strife. Sometimes we just say things. Sometimes we're looking for conversation. Sometimes we're looking for just somebody that we can confide in, and we say something, well, I don't like how this person does whatever. And then that person and goes tells someone else, either the friend or someone else who tells the friend, and now what's happened? You've got this wedge driven between you and your friend. You know, how could you say that you don't like this about me? Why didn't you talk to me? How, why are you telling everybody else? And maybe you only told one person, that that person could have told a hundred. You know how these things spread. It's very, very easy for gossip to drive wedges between friends. Now, let's take that a step further. Married folks, who's supposed to be one of your closest friends? Your spouse. Does this ever happen in a marriage? Do you ever have people gossiping and you see strife in the marriage because something a spouse says to somebody else gets back to their spouse? It can destroy any friendship. Gossip can be a very serious thing. So a lot of times when we talk about gossip, we, we don't really dismiss it, but it, it's a very easy one to kind of think, eh, I mean, I know it's bad, but, and, and I don't know why we do that. I think maybe some of it is rationalizing because I think so many of us are guilty of it. I know I'm guilty of it. There's a lot of times I look back, I'm like, why in the world was I even talking about whatever that was? And I didn't really think it through. But it is so serious and so damaging. We really, really, really need to guard what we say. But I don't know why it is so easy 
for us to kind of look at gossip and be like, oh, yeah, gossip, yeah, that's bad. Folks, gossip is bad. It's bad. It sows discord. It gets rid of harmony. So I want to encourage us tonight to think harder about the relationships we have and the things we're saying about other people, and do they really need to know it? Is it their business or not? It doesn't matter if it's something you think you know or something you really know. Think through what is the long-term ramification. Yes, sir. Sure. We like a mystery, right? Hmm. Yeah. Well, in in our society, a lot of times we don't we don't like that direct confrontation, that direct interaction. And you mentioned social media. You know, the mass communication and social media that we have today falls right into this whole gossip trap, you know, because we can communicate so much faster. It was harder to spread gossip around when you actually had to meet up with somebody at the well as they were drawing the water, right? Now, you can be texting people who are at the well on the other side of the planet instantly. So we, we can gossip at light speed now. Yay. And we do it. And it, it's convenient. You know, we have all these tools now that this kind of thing can have impact faster than it ever has before because we're so connected. Sometimes we see harmony disrupted when we have a stubborn person who insists on their own way and they're putting their way or their needs over the needs or ideas of others. So this isn't gossip now. Now we're talking just another way that people sow discord. They, they dig in their heels. They draw that line in the sand. I, I'm not going to listen to any argument. I'm not going to budge in any way. I'm going to dig in. Now, Sometimes it's good to dig in. When we're talking about the truth of God's word, that's important. We need to dig in. We don't need to compromise on God's word. But there's a whole lot of things that come up in life that aren't directly what's talked about in God's word. And sometimes we dig our heels in just as hard as if it's gospel truth and we're not listening to reason or we're not willing to compromise or we're not willing to give other people a chance to look from a different perspective, believe it or not, you all don't think the same way I do. And that's shocking to me. But you could say the same about all the rest of us. That's a hard thing to understand because... In our minds, of course we're right. But we've each had different experiences. We have different amounts of knowledge on different topics. All kinds of things have shaped 
the way that we think about things, the way we, we react to things, and we come up with a mindset of what is right. Well, sometimes right can have different angles, different colors, different reflections. <clears throat> Just because it's right by my perspective doesn't mean it's wrong by your perspective. You can also have a different perspective and still be right on a topic. Again, I'm not talking about different ways to deal with God's word. I'm talking about things that come up in life. So we need to listen to others. We don't need to just dig in and stubbornly refuse to hear other ideas and other th things that people want to talk about. That sows discord. That's not harmony. We kind of sometimes think, well, unity, if you just think like me, we'd all be united. But how boring would that be, too? How many times do you interact with somebody and they come up with a, just a great idea or some, some exciting new thing that you never would have thought of? Us having these different perspectives and being able to have these kinds of interactions, that's one of the great things in life. But sometimes we prevent ourselves from enjoying it because we just get so dug in on my way. Then, talking about God's word, sometimes we have unity disrupted by someone who's trying to introduce something that's not authorized into the practice of the Lord's worship. You ever see that happen? Yeah. Well, let's, let's take a stroll down, pick a street, start counting churches. They got different names, right? They got different creeds, they got different books, they got different beliefs. That's discord. That's disharmony. That's exactly what we're talking about. That's what God didn't want to happen. He knew it was going to happen. He warned us it was going to happen. But that's not what he wanted to happen. But we see that strife, that discord introduced. Any thoughts or comments on any of these? All right. Well, as I promised, we're going to add a few other things that God finds as an abomination or things that God abhors. We talked about those seven out of Proverbs chapter 6, but there's a few others in Proverbs that we're going to look at as well. So this is kind of a spin on this idea of lying uh, or with false witness, you know, those were related. Uh, God also condemns dishonesty in business. And we see that a couple of times in Proverbs. Let's turn to Proverbs 11, verse 1. Proverbs 11 and verse 1. It says, Dishonest scales are an abomination to the Lord, but a just weight is his delight. All right, now let's turn a few pages over. Proverbs 20, verse 10. Proverbs 20, verse 10. Diverse weights and diverse measures, they are both alike an abomination to the Lord. So, first of all, the first verse we read kind of helps us understand what exactly is being said in the second verse. So, in Proverbs 11, it said dishonest scales are an abomination to the Lord. So we don't do as much shopping today by weight. Now, there are some things you go to the grocery store and we, we weigh out, but buying by weight was far more common in older times. You know, so you would purchase you know, X amount of weight of this or that good. Now we pick up, well, it's a can of whatever, and it's got the price tag on it. It doesn't really matter what it weighs. Now, fruit and, you know, some meat and things like that, we're still used to that idea. But we also, I think a lot of times, forget 
that the scales even involved because it seems so like magically automated now, right? Due to technology, you just put it across that little scanner thing. It's got the weight in it, and we assume that's accurate, right? We trust that that's accurate. We don't know that it's accurate, but we trust that it is. So it says here that God does not like a dishonest scale. Now, an inaccurate scale does not necessarily have to be a dishonest scale. You know, your scale could be broken and you not know it, and that's a problem, but that's not what God is talking about here. What God is talking about here is the idea that the scale is set correctly. If you set it incorrectly, why would you set it incorrectly? So that you could cheat people. If the scale, you're selling, selling something by the pound, and the scale is actually measuring at 0.8 pounds as a pound, you're overcharging. You're not having to move as much product to get as much money, and how many of us can tell 0.2 pounds of difference just by picking up something? Probably not. Probably not that precise. So that's kind of an easy thing to get away with, right? You change the scales measure. God hates that. God wants us to be honest with our dealings with one another. It's a form of lying. It's a form of stealing. And it also leads to other issues. Has anybody ever been killed because someone cheated them? Yeah. Now, is it over hamburger? Maybe, maybe not. But the idea of you sold me this under false pretense, that gets people angry. There's that ripple effect of sin again. It's bad. God hates it because it's bad, but he also hates it because of the further effects that this can have in society. He hates a dishonest scale. It says a just weight is his delight. Well, that makes sense. That tracks with what we know about God. This idea of let your yes be yes, your no be no. Let what you say be the truth. If you're doing business, let what you are saying you are doing in business be the truth. So in Proverbs 20, verse 10, it said, Diverse weights and diverse measures, they are alike an abomination to the Lord. So what in the world is a diverse weight or a diverse measure? Well, an example here would be using one weight for when you are buying and a different weight when you are selling. So, hey, let's, let's put this on this scale here, and, yeah, this, this one's accurate. This one's measuring out 10 pounds. And this one's marked 10 pounds, but it's really only measuring 8. And so you're buying. It's honest for you when you're buying, but it's dishonest when you're selling, diverse weights. Yes, sir. Sure. Yeah, and, and taxes are a great example of that. You know, so changing, changing what you report on your taxes is the same concept here. You know, this, this idea of dishonesty in business and honesty in business. 
you know, so two sets of records, falsification of records, presenting a lie for profit is what God is condemning right here. So we really can say that fair marketing laws, that's not really invented by man. That's invented by God. God wants us to be fair in business. God also hates the justification of wickedness along with the condemnation of justice. It's Proverbs 17, 15. Proverbs 17, 15. It says, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them alike are an abomination to the Lord. So justifying the wicked, that would be standing up for the person that is doing the wrong thing. You know, you're, you're uh, trying to make them sound better. You're making excuses for them. You are trying to sanctify, if you will, the sinful person, the wrongdoer. God hates that. Also, if you're trying to tear down the just person, the honest person, you're lying against them, bearing false witness against them, you are disparaging them, whatever it is. God hates that too. He wants us to be honest. He wants us to call things like we see them. If it's sin, call it sin. Treat it like sin. If it is holy, call it holy. Treat it like it's holy. Don't cross the two. Now, we see in society, wickedness often gets sanctioned when immorality becomes socially acceptable. That's society in mass doing what God says don't do. That's society saying this thing that God says is wrong, society says is good. God hates that. He doesn't want us to do that. So look, for example, and I'm going through these kind of quick, hoping we can get done before the bell. Look at God's attitude toward fornication, divorce, gambling, drinking, and other sins. How many of these things are put forth as good things or not as bad things? You know, it's, some of them are even celebrated in society. That's not what God wants. How many things involve justice or the truth or what God wants us to do? How many things does society condemn and say, well, that's not acceptable. That's old-fashioned thinking. That's just that's just what's in that old book. That, that doesn't apply to the times of change. There's a million different excuses. That's what God's talking about. He hates that. We often use softer words for justifying bad things. Opposing pornography, we call that censorship. Oh, no, that's a bad word, right? Censorship. Yeah, we can't have that. Opposing abortion, that's an attack on freedom of choice. Censorship's bad, right? But what's it being applied to? Freedom of choice, oh, we, we all want freedom, but what is it talking about? We put these good-sounding terms and we put this spin on it, but we're talking about something that God doesn't want us to do. Preaching the idea of one church, one united church, we see that as an attack on individuality. I, I want to be my own person, my own ideas. So God abhors the worship of wickedness. So Proverbs 15, verse 8 says, The sacrifice of the wicked is an abomination to the Lord, but the prayer of the upright is his delight. And then Proverbs 28, verse 9 Proverbs 28, verse 9, it says, One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. We were so close to finishing tonight. All right, we'll wrap up there. We've got two more slides, and uh, then we'll move on to section five next week.